Welcome to this introduction to anatomy and medical terminology. We will be discussing the following topics. First of all, the fundamentals of word structure. Then we'll be dealing with the anatomical position, anatomical planes, the terms of relationship and comparison, terms of movement, the skeletal system, the muscular system, and last but not least, the skin and fascia. Here are the lecture objectives for you. You should be able to recognize the component parts, so the prefix, the word root, and the suffix of medical and anatomical terms, and also begin to learn their meanings in order to enhance your professional vocabulary. Describe the anatomical position and define the three major anatomical planes of the body. Define the sets of terms which are used to describe the relationship of structures to one another in the body. List the three main axes around which movements of the body occur and define those movements. List the functions of the skeletal system and describe how bones are classified. With regard to skeletal muscles, discuss the meaning of the terms proximal and distal attachments, aka origin and insertion, fleshy and fibrous components, motor unit, and proprioceptive fibers. Describe the structure and functions of the skin, superficial fascia, and deep fascia. And appreciate that all anatomical structures are subject to variation. Taking an anatomy course is somewhat like a language course. The more you speak it, the better you will get at it. Nous devons parler la même langue. Wir müssen dieselbe Sprache sprechen, um klar und bedeutungsvoll miteinander zu kommunizieren. We need to speak the same language to communicate in an accurate and meaningful way. There are several dictionaries or medical dictionaries that will contain many, many terms, over 100,000 terms and definitions that are used in medicine and anatomical sciences. It is especially important that medical and scientific communities throughout the world use the same name for each structure. The Terminologica Anatomica book supersedes all previous lists and contains the internationally accepted and appropriate terminology for human gross or topographical anatomy, including neuroanatomy, both in Latin and English. This book is truly an international and scientifically based attempt to identify a best term for each structure. Medical or anatomical medical terms are typically composed of three component parts. First, a word root, which conveys the central meaning of the word. A prefix, which means to fix before the beginning of a word. A prefix can be a syllable or a group of syllables. Prefixes alter the meanings of words or create entirely new words. And a suffix, that means to fasten on the end of a word. A suffix can be a syllable or a group of syllables. Suffixes alter the meanings of words to create entirely new words. When you break down a word to understand it, you usually begin with the meaning of the suffix. Here's an example. The word mal for me shun. The prefix mal means bad. Format is the root, means a shaping. And ian, the suffix, means process. Malformation. Here's another example. Chemotherapy. This is a combining form, which is a word root to which a vowel has been added. In this case, the o to chem. This vowel will link the root to the suffix or to another word. In this case it would be therapy, means treatment. So in that case it means chemotherapy is the treatment of a disease using chemical agents, which is exactly what it is. Eponyms, for instance, Cooper's ligaments. Eponyms should actually usually be avoided. They're kind of the antithesis of evidence-based medicine. They don't convey any kind of information about the nature of the structure involved, and they're frequently inaccurate historically, since the person that is being commemorated was by no means the first to describe the structure. Eponyms are unfortunately quite common in clinical practice. They are frequently used as a way of pimping, so hazing, the less experienced, in this case often residents, for instance, of surgery. We will inform you about eponyms, that are commonly used, but they should be avoided in your communications with other professionals. Spelling and pronunciation are also quite important. You will see that there are regional, global differences in pronunciation, but there are general rules how you should pronounce things. For instance, abduct means to lead away. Adduct means to lead toward. Often, anatomists will actually say abduct and adduct just to emphasize 
what motion we actually mean because there's not very much of a phonetical difference between these. This word is pronounced ptosis, not ptosis. Also, a personal pet peeve of mine is the mispronunciation of these words here. I have encountered that a couple of times, luckily not very frequently. You pronounce these larynx and pharynx. Please, do not ever pronounce this larynx, and even worse, this pharynx. There's not a reason in the universe why this should be pronounced larynx. Some muscles describe shape. Trapezius, kind of pretty intuitive, it is trapezoidal in shape. The digastric muscle is a muscle with two bellies. There is an anterior belly and a posterior belly. Di, gastric, two bellies. Some terms will describe the function. If there's a muscle that attaches to the superior part of the scapula here and to the superior cervical vertebrae, for instance, and it contracts, it elevates the scapula. So why don't we just go ahead and call it levator scapulae. Anatomical position. The anatomical position is with the body erect, the head, eyes, and the toes directed forward. The upper limbs are at the side, held so that the palms of the hands face forward, and the lower limbs are close together. All anatomical descriptions are expressed in, in relation to this one consistent anatomical position, thus ensuring that descriptions are not ambiguous. Anatomical planes. There is a median plane, which is basically the vertical plane that passes longitudinally through the body. This will split the body into right and left equal halves. The sagittal plane is going to be any plane that is parallel to the median plane. But of course, as it's not in the median plane, it'll divide the body into unequal halves. Then there is a coronal plane, also referred to as frontal plane. That is any plane that will intersect the median plane at a right angle and separate the body into a anterior and posterior part, so into a front and back part. Of course, these are going to be unequal again. And then you have the transverse plane, also called axial plane, which is any plane that is cut at a right angle to both the median and the coronal planes. This will separate the body into an upper and lower half. This is also a plane that you're going to see very often when you're looking at MRI and CT scans. Here's your median plane, here's your coronal plane, and here is your transverse plane. So let's have a look at terms of relative position. Afferent means toward and efferent means away from. Medial and lateral mean medial means closer to the median plane. For instance, the fifth digit of the upper limb, so of the hand here, is closer to the median plane than the thumb. The thumb, for instance, is further lateral from the median plane than the pinky finger. Anterior means closer to the front then posterior, which means closer to the back. It's also called ventral versus dorsal. Inferior or caudal means closer to the feet. For instance, the stomach would be inferior to the heart, and the heart would be superior to the stomach. So the cranial head is superior, and the caudal end is inferior. Proximal is closer to the trunk or to the point of origin, for instance, a limb. The elbow, for example, would be proximal to the wrist, which is distal to the elbow. The proximal part of an artery, for instance, would be its beginning. If you look at the hands and the feet, you would have palmer versus dorsal. Dorsal is the back of your hand. Palmer is the surface of your hand, or the palm of your hand, of course. In the feet, this is similar, only that we call it dorsal versus plantar instead of palmer. If we think of tissue layers, you would have superficial tissue, that means it's close to the surface. A muscle of an arm is superficial to the bone of the arm, the humerus. Intermediate would be right in between a superficial and a deep structure. The biceps, for instance, is a muscle that is intermediate between the skin and the bone of the arm, the humerus. Deep is something that is especially far from the surface. The humerus would be deep to the muscles of the arm. Terms of laterality. Sidedness. This is sidedness. Unilateral means only on one side. Things that are unilateral would be the liver, the spleen on the other side, and the appendix. Bilateral would be structures that are paired, for instance, your lungs, or the scapulae, or the clavicles. Ipsilateral means on the same side. For instance, the liver and the appendix would be on the same side. Contralateral 
means on opposite sides. So the spleen is on the opposite side as the liver. In terms of movement, let's go ahead and use the shoulder joint here as an example. The horizontal axis passing through the shoulder joint is represented by an imaginary line which is perpendicular to the plane of the slide that passes from lateral to medial through the head of the humerus. The axis would appear as a dot on this slide, just about here. Flexion is to bring the arm forward, the blue arrow, and extension is to bring the arm backward, the green arrow. Same is here the case for the lower limb, flexion and extension. Flexion of the leg at the knee joint is in the direction of the blue arrow and extension is in the direction of the green arrow. Flexion of the forearm at the elbow joint occurs like this in the direction of the blue arrow and extension in the direction of the green arrow. You can also flex and extend your trunk as indicated here by those arrows. Your hand flexes and extends like this at the wrist joint. The fingers flex, for instance, when you make a fist. Abduction of the arm is when you move the arm away from the body in a horizontal axis. Adduction, as if you add something, is when you add the arm back to the body in the anatomical position. The same thing here with the lower limb. If you abduct it, you move it away from the central axis, the midline. When you adduct it, you move it back towards the midline. You can also rotate both the upper and lower limb externally or laterally or internally. So if this foot would be moved with the big toe going away from the midline, that would be external or lateral rotation and the opposite would be internal or medial rotation. If you kind of rotate the lower limb like this, you're making a circular motion. If you had a crayon on there or a laser pointer and the resulting figure would be a circle that is called circumduction. Your hand switching it from palm up to palm down is called supination and pronation. Think of it like for supination if you're holding a bowl of soup that would mean your hand is supinated. You also have opposition and reposition. Opposition would be the motion where you oppose the thumb and the little finger at the carpal metacarpal joints of the thumb combined with a flexion of the MP joints. Shrugging your shoulders is actually a mix of elevation and depression. Moving your shoulder forward, like reaching for something, is protraction and moving your shoulder backward here is retraction. You can do the same thing with your chin. This is becoming quite intuitive now. You can protrude your chin, moving it forward, creating an overbite or retract your chin, called retrusion, creating an underbite. So let's talk about morphology a little bit. How are our bodies made? The word morphology is actually from the ancient Greek, like many things in medicine and anatomy, and it basically means form and to study or research. The biological concept of morphology was actually developed originally by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, in 1790, and independently by the German anatomist and physiologist Karl Friedrich Burdach in 1800. Let's have a look at the four structural principles of human bodies. First of all, we are regional creatures, so we can subdivide us into different anatomical regions like limbs or abdomen, thorax, head, feet, and so on and so forth. Even small children know this because any stick figure they represent will represent basically a very simplified version of what we can see on this image. Next, we're layered or stratified. You can see we have skin with its different elements and layers that you will learn about uh, in different lectures. And of course, when we then open and close the skin, we get access to the deeper regions, which could be muscles or internal organs. And of course, we are also systemic creatures. A systems approach would be primarily functional and, for instance, consider physiology especially. And last but not least, we're also segmented creatures. This segmentation, which we can see represented here as the dermatomes, so the sensory patches of our skin represented by one pair of spinal nerves each, is something that is very, very, very conserved across evolution. Even annelids, so little ringworms, have a segmented body. 
Our skeletal system, so the osteology, consists of all the bones and cartilages and, of course, the joints or articulations between them that helps them move relative to each other. And you're going to see that there are a lot of specializations concerning the joints. You can have ball and socket joints, for instance, or hinge joints, and many more different modifications of joints. This is all made so that we are perfectly adept to an upright lifestyle. Also, don't forget that we have to differentiate primarily between what is the axial skeleton around the central axis, which is the vertebral column, and whatever hangs off of it, which is the appendicular skeleton, so the upper and lower limbs, for instance. Some of the functions of the bones that make up our skeleton are, of course, to support the body or the body weight, to protect the organs on the inside, and to provide as an attachment for all the muscles for sake of our movement. Also, our bones have bone marrow that can help in generating blood cells, and they aid in the storage and exchange of calcium and phosphate ions. Developmentally, we have to classify between different types of bones, cartilage bones, for instance, the humerus, membranous bones like the clavicle up here. And then, as I've already said, regionally with the axial skeleton and then the appendicular skeletons. Also, the shape of the bones becomes quite apparent. You have these long bones, you have short bones like the carpal bones, you also have sesamoid bones, for instance the patella here, or flat bones like the sternum, and irregular bones which are your vertebrae, which although they look similar, they do differ considerably depending on what region you look at, in the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, or even more radical in the sacral region. Our muscular system. The muscular system, so the myology, consists of muscles, that act to move or position parts of the body. When you study the attachments of muscles, it is actually pretty useful to try to act out the action of the muscle you are studying. If you know the attachment, you can usually deduct the action. The origin is usually the fixed end, the insertion is movable. Under most circumstances, the sternum and the clavicle will remain fixed, so that when the SCM contracts bilaterally, the head and neck would be flexed, so bent forward as if you are nodding. However, if your head and neck are held stationary by muscles in the back of your neck, contraction of the SCM can elevate the sternum and the clavicle. Like, for instance, when you have run a couple of miles, so during forced inspiration. You will probably also encounter the terms proximal and distal attachment. Some muscles will actually act in both directions under different circumstances. For instance, when you're doing push-ups, the distal end of your upper limb, the hand, becomes fixed and the proximal end of the limb and the trunk are being moved. Most modern books will actually use the terminology proximal and distal, and medial and lateral, respectively. If we have a slightly more up-close look at the muscles themselves, we can tell that they have a fleshy and a fibrous component. The fleshy component, so the belly, is contractile. There's a high metabolic activity, it's very vascular, so with ischemia one experiences muscle pain and fatigue. It doesn't have a very high tensile strength and cannot withstand pressure. It doesn't leave any mark on the bone, if removed, because it is not really attached to the bone. This happens with the fibrous component, the tendon or aponeurosis. The tendon itself is not going to be contractile. It has a very low metabolic activity and a sparse blood supply, but it has a very, very high tensile strength, something between 8,600 and 18,000 pounds per square inch. So when there's a sudden strain, the tendon won't rupture. It can withstand pressure and it leaves tubercles and ridges etc on bones to help guide them and to help them attach. So how do muscles contract? This would be the description of a motor unit. A motor neuron in the central nervous system, its axon and all of its skeletal muscle fibers innervated by that axon are considered a motor unit. All the muscle fibers of the motor unit will contract simultaneously. It's kind of the all or none principle. So a motor unit can be considered the smallest part of a muscle that can undergo isolated contraction. The general rule here would be, the more precise the action of a muscle, the smaller its motor units. For instance, the little muscles moving our eyes, the extraocular muscles, control the movement of the eyeball with 
only about three fibers per motor unit. On the other hand, the hip and the thigh muscles have about 150 to 1600 fibers per motor unit. Usually the contraction of motor units within a muscle is automatically rotated so that fatigue is quite minimal. And you can also voluntarily control the strength of contraction by engaging progressively more motor units at once. You can also choose to voluntarily contract only a specific part of a muscle, which is especially important in cases where a single muscle has two or more functions. For instance, think about the anterior part of the deltoid muscle, so this large triangular muscle on your shoulder that helps flex the arm, but the posterior fibers extend the arm. At the neuromuscular junction down here, the transmitter released is acetylcholine. This is why neurofibers to skeletal muscle are termed cholinergic, and they can be blocked by toxins such as curare. Now let's have a look at skin and fascia. Skin provides many important functions, and actually it's a very good indicator for a person's general health. So if you very carefully pay attention to what this individual's skin looks like, it can be clinically pretty important. For example, someone with bluish skin, so cyanotic skin, indicates that there's not enough oxygen being carried to it via the blood. On the other hand, very red skin, so erythrema, can indicate infection, inflammation, or allergic reactions. Yellow skin, which we call jaundice, can indicate liver disorders. Skin provides protection from environmental hazards. It contains the body's vital substances. It helps us with heat regulation. It helps us feel the outside world. It is important for the synthesis and storage of vitamin D. Let's have a brief look of some of the layers of the skin and its specialized structures. Starting off with the epidermis, which is the superficial layer of skin. It is cellular. It has a tough keratinized outer layer, which is protective, and a deep basal layer, which is regenerative. Deep to the epidermis is the dermis. It's a deeper layer of skin. Connective tissue consisting of collagen and elastic fibers. These collagen fibers will provide strength and toughness. The elastic fibers, on the other hand, provide the tone to the skin. Elastic fibers, as we age, unfortunately deteriorate, so that leads to wrinkling of skin. The dermis also contains hair follicles, associated with little muscles, which are called erector pili muscles, and sebaceous glands. These erector muscles will cause hairs to stand up on end, and those sebaceous glands will secrete an oily substance. Then we have superficial fascia, so subcutaneous tissue, which is mostly composed of loose tissue and fat. This also contains sweat glands, some superficial blood vessels, and lymphatics that send their branches up to pass into the dermis to form vascular beds. There are also cutaneous nerves that send fibers into the dermis and the epidermis where some of the fibers have afferent, so sensory receptors or endings, which are important for pain, temperature, and touch, while other fibers might innervate sweat glands with sympathetic motor fibers. Deep fascia is beneath all of the superficial fascia and covers the skeletal muscle tissue. One more important point to make here if we're talking about skin is the cleavage lines or tension lines of Langer. Yeah? These will be determined predominantly by the directions of the collagen bundles in the skin and so incisions or lacerations that will be parallel to these lines will generally gape less and heal with less scar formation than incisions that are made perpendicular to the direction of these lines. Deep fascia also helps bind down muscles and give form to the body. It also forms sheaths for vessels and nerves. Here, for instance, is the deep fascia of the thigh called the fascia lata. This forms a sleeve around muscles of the thigh and binds them down, so giving the thigh shape. Here is an example of the femoral sheath for the deep fascia forming a sheath that is surrounding vessels. In this case, sometimes it can also surround nerves. Deep fascia provides protection for vessels and nerves, for instance here in the palm of the hand, forming the palmar aponeurosis, which protects the underlying structures, the nerves and vessels, from damage. Deep fascia helps us compartmentalize the body. The leg, for instance, can be divided into three different osteofascial compartments, which would be anterior, posterior, and lateral, by the deep fascia of the leg, the anterior and posterior intermuscular septa, and also the interosseous membrane, which unites the bones, the tibia and fibula. The posterior compartment we can further subdivide 
into superficial and deep parts by the transverse muscular septa. Each compartment will contain muscles with similar function and their own neurovascular supply.